closed captions. Wonderful, we have closed captions here. Add course captions, closed captions. All right, it works. And the share screen. The screen, that's the screen.
All right, let's do the audio test and video test. Hello, everyone. If you can hear me, well, let's do it differently. If you cannot hear me, then write that something down and we'll make sure to fix it. But nevertheless, in three minutes, we'll start with our last workshop for today. This one is going to be about uh, wild, wild applications, the wild applications that are deployed across multiple regions. So go ahead and uh, take a cup of coffee, tea or beer, whatever you like, and depending what time is it right now in your location, because I know that the folks from all over the world have joined the summit. For some of us, it's still uh, the mid of a working day, while the others might already just pour a glass of wine and uh, watch this last uh, coding session. session. Two minutes to go. By the way, uh, let's do this. If you came to this session to get answers to any specific questions, write them down right now. I want to see them because if I see that the question is going to be addressed and answered during this session, then I will just tell you immediately. And then you would be just waiting for the moment when uh, a solution is shown. Or if the question is not going to be, is not planned to be covered in the session, then I'll find, you know, some way to get it answered. So think about your questions. If, you de if there's anything you definitely want me to cover today, write it down. One minute to go. Okay, it's 4 p.m. in the United States East Coast. It's 1 p.m. in the West Coast and uh, Probably it's, it's already late night in Asia and it's late evening in Europe. Hello to the final to the final workshop, and let's move forward. The workshop about is about geo distributed applications or about multi region applications. So a little bit of myself. We're not going to have any slides. Uh, it's just a coding session. This uh, file that you see on the screen right now is basically everything that you want to read today and the rest is going to be just coding, coding and launching the application. So my name is uh, Dennis Magda. I've been working with distributed databases, application and systems uh, for the last eight years. And my primary focus is application developers. I'm interested in uh, building applications that use various distributed technologies. And that's why this session is focused on geo-distributed apps because that's my passion and that's my interest. If uh, you would like, if you like this presentation, stay till the end. If you like it, you can give me a follow on Twitter. Or if you have any negative feedback, it's also an opportunity to give me a follow and discuss it uh, privately. So the agenda for today, right? And let's just uh, uh, nail some of the items. First, we need to understand uh, what are the geo-distributed applications. So generally, a geo-distributed application is an application that spans multiple 
uh, distant geographies. And those distant geographies might be multiple data centers, multiple availability zones, or several regions. So generally, if you want to match geo-distributed apps to some other well-known term, then geo-distributed apps are equal to multi-AZ apps, multi-availability zone, multi-DC, multi-data centers if you're running in private environment or hybrid environment, and certainly multi-region data centers. Okay, easy, right? So the first item of this workshop is answered. Now you know like what is a geo-distributed application. So the second question and the second item that you need to understand is why would you build and why would you design are these type of applications. And the question is very easy. Generally, I define three reasons uh, for why would the one to build those types of applications. The first one is high availability. So generally, you want your applications to withstand various outages in your private data center, so in the cloud. And those outages can be something minor, like there is some network glitch, or it can be a full outage in your availability zone or region. You, want to, you don't want to be impacted by those types of outages. And this is why you build geo-distributed applications. Another uh, reason is uh, low latency. And here is I'm talking uh, about global low latency. That's, that's important global low latency because you can have your users and your customers living in New York City, in San Francisco, in London, in Paris, in Mumbai, in Sydney, and probably you want all of them to have the same application experience. You want them to have the same low latency. You want your application to deliver the same low latency regardless of the location of your customers. So that's why you also need geo-distributed applications. And finally, probably this is the most boring, but also one of the most important criterias for building geo-distributed uh, applications is data residency requirements. You don't want to mess up with your taxes and you don't want to mess up with data regulators, with governments, because many applications have to store customer data in uh, the countries of their residency. For instance, if you create any solution, any service or any app for the guys who live in uh, European Union, then you need to be aware about uh, the GDPR, General Data Protection Regulations uh, law. And uh, also when you design geo-distributed applications, you also can handle and you can kind of comply with all of those data residency requirements. So having said that, now you understand what those geo-distributed applications are needed. So let's is we have done with this part of the workshop and you need them for high availability. You need them to achieve global low latency and you want to be able to comply with data regulatory requirements. Make sense, folks? Any questions, write down in the chat because I will be moving fast, but from time to time, I will be turning my head to the left and checking uh, if there is anything that you need me to dive into. But now let's get to the most exciting part of this workshop. Let's build a geo-distributed application. And there's going to be a pizza company, some pizza service, right? Like who, who doesn't like pizza? Probably just 1% of the population. Uh, nevertheless, first, let's start with the dev prototype, developer prototype. And uh, I have it ready here. I'm a, it's a Java application, uh, but generally this session is for you, even if you write in JavaScript, Python, Rust, or any other programming language, because we're not going to dive uh, into the source code. I'm not going to write any application logic. The application logic is ready. So generally what I have, I have two uh, microservices. The first one is the kitchen microservice, and the second one is the tracker microservice, what those microservices are for. So if you take a look at the kitchen microservice controller, so generally, let's say that you created this pizza service, and some your first customer is ready to buy a pizza. What, what happens? They pull up their mobile phone, they go to the, uh, they open your application, they select the location and they order the pizza. And this pizza order ends up in this kitchen controller and this kitchen service. So generally, uh, the dump implementation does this. It will insert the pizza order into the database and then you can update the status for your pizza order, blah, 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 all that basic stuff. The second microservice, uh, which is the tracker, so what the tracker does 
it also comes, you know, just with one controller for now. It's enough for our multi-region experiments, geo-distributed experiments. Uh, but that's also customer-facing microservice because when that, once you ordered your pizza, right, you're hungry probably. You just want to get that crusty pizza as soon as possible. And you, and from time to time, you're checking on uh, the status. And this microservice does this. You can send the, the application will be sending... Uh, HTTP request to this microservice to get the status. Let's say that's my pizza orders. Uh, uh, there is that's the order ID, that's the location, and just quickly tell me the status. So simple, like two two customer facing microservices. The kitchen one that is used to put new orders in the system, and the tracker one that is used to check uh, the status of your order. Also, I have some kind of uh, utility. Uh, two utilities. I have discovery server. And uh, this is from the Spring Cloud ecosystem. If you're a Java developer and you should know Spring Cloud, uh, Discovery Server allows my microservices to register there, and then microservices can easily connect to each other using just their names. You don't need they don't need to know any IP addresses, IP addresses of each other. They just basically can register with the Discovery Server, and then they can easily locate each other through the Discovery Server APIs. And finally. I mean, I will have this uh, kitchen and tracker microservices somewhere running in the cloud environment, but I don't want uh, my mobile applications or my web front end to talk to those microservices directly. What I will do, I will deploy an API gateway. And uh, uh, in the Java world, if you're a Java developer, in the Java world, we are using your, many of us use uh, uh, Spring Cloud Gateway or like Corn Gateway. Uh, I'm using Spring Cloud Gateway here. So the, basically if, what uh, this uh, dummy implementation does, if the request is for the kitchen microservice, then the request will be forwarded to this kitchen service. And Gateway also registers with the discovery server. So like very quick introduction, okay? And if the request is for the tracker, then it's going to be handled by the tracker microservice. So this is our pizza service. The, naive and simple implementation, the dev prototype that we want to run and experiment with like tracker service, kitchen service, and two utility services, discovery server, and uh, the API gateway. So now let's move forward and start this in, uh, in Docker. I'm starting, let me do this, uh, Docker compose up. Everything is being created. While it's being created, let me show you the Docker Compose file. So what's inside? Generally, I'm starting the discovery server, kitchen service, and uh, kitchen and tracker are connecting to this. They use Postgres JDBC driver to connect to the Postgres database. So by default, they will be connected. The dev, the, the dev version will be connecting to Postgres. So like the, the, the implementation is created for the Postgres. And my I have Postgres container running. Uh, let me see where, if I do this, docker, container, ls, so Postgres, Postgres, yeah, Postgres is here, so we have Postgres. So let's quickly check the logs, yeah, the application has connected successfully, and now let's check whether our APIs work or not. First, you know that we have this discovery server, and every microservice registers with it. All right, so uh, that server by default runs on this IP address. So if you take a look, that's the IP address, port uh, 8761. And here is I have the kitchen service, tracker service, and the gateway. All of those instances are registered with the discovery. Wonderful. Now let's uh, send a few requests uh, to their application using the gateway. So the gateway is listening on port 8080. So let's keep the slides. So what I want to do is open new tab. And on this new tab, all right, let's do this. Let's first, uh, yeah, let's do this first. First, I want to delete all possible orders that already exist in the system. I'm sending a request to the local host port 8080. The gateway is listening on this port number. And I'm sending this request to the kitchen service because the kitchen service is responsible for the orders. And I'm asking to delete. So I want to delete. I want to clear the database. All right, all the orders have been deleted. Wonderful. We don't have anything in the database. So now let's send another request. Let's 
imagine that our users finally discovered our pizza company. They want to order some margarita pizza and they use mobile applications and the mobile application sends this HTTP request to the gateway. So again, this request, this is the post request and we want to uh, accept the first order for the customer who lives in New York City. All right. Uh, let's do this. Two, three, three orders have been placed into there. Uh, uh, into the system. Wonderful. So it works. And how about our second microservice, the tracker, right? The, we already have three orders in the system, and right now we want to check up, uh, check out the status. So for that, again, we are going to send all of the connections, the mobile application or the web front end is going to connect to the gateway directly. And this time the gateway will forward the request of the tracker microservice. Again, let's check this one. I don't need to, to specify any location for now. I'm just doing this. Okay, so the status for the first order, it's ordered, and the chaff is not baking anything yet. I don't like this. But nevertheless, generally the application, this simple dummy application is ready, and it runs on my local laptop. It uses uh, PostgreSQL. All the data is stored in PostgreSQL. If you want to double check that, uh, let's connect to my Postgres instance. And the user is uh, Postgres, and the password is password. So I have this pizza order, and uh, in here we have all the records. Good, those are three orders, done. All right, so now let's talk about geo-distributed application. The prototype is ready, we are ready to go in production. And uh, first, what we need to do? This one is done, right? Following our agenda, the dev prototype is ready and working. So next, let's say that uh, the business guys reviewed the prototype, they like the implementation, and now it's time to go in production. And first, we are a startup company, right? We are brick and mortar uh, pizza shop. We allow you just to, there are no any specific locations. You just generally, if you live in New York or New Jersey, you can order this pizza and uh, the pizza will be delivered to you online. So, and we decided to open the first kind of, we started providing this service in the United States. So, and when we do this, like, uh, we don't know like whether we will fail or not, but we just want to scale gradually. We don't want just to deploy our application across the planet. Uh, we just want to do this step by step. Once we see the momentum, we will keep scaling our application. We will keep scaling our database. But for the grand opening in the United States, what kind of cluster do we want to use? We already have the application. We will deploy this application in uh, the United States East region in a public cloud. And as for the database, we are going to use a multi-region YugaBiDB deployment. Why uh, multi-region? You can, you certainly can deploy a multi-AZ uh, instance in a single region, but we know that regions, even regions fail in the public cloud. And that's why we want to, we don't, we, we, we want to avoid this. So that's why we will deploy a multi-region cluster in the US East coast that's what we are going to do let's proceed with that okay so what i have my environment we no longer need this local application instance let me shut it down it works i have this let me zoom this for you i have three virtual machines one of them is in the united states east coast and then we have two others in europe and australia we will get to the other two a little bit later as for the united states east let me connect to it because this is where i want to deploy my first application instance because we are opening our first uh, pizza locations in for, for new york and for new jersey customers so that's my ip address how do we connect to the virtual machine Right, we are using SSH. You just need to have some uh, key, and that's my username, that's my IP address. Yep, that's my passphrase. You, you don't know it. And now, what I want to do, uh, let me, I will change, I want to remove this one because I want to have some, you know, shorter definition in the console. So, that's uh, my virtual machine in the United States East Coast. And I go to the samples directory, and this is my pizza order application and I have the version for Spring Cloud. 
done. So what's next? Let's deploy this application instance that was running on my local machine uh, a few minutes ago. For that, I'm going to use a special script. Why do I use this special script? Because inside of this script, so let me show you the Docker file. The file, what it does, uh, the Docker file uh, requires you to provide the database endpoint for the tracker and for the kitchen microservice, and also the username and the database password. And I'm using this special script because, guys, I don't want you to see my password. I'm using some real production cluster of Yuga by DB, and that's why I'm going to use uh, special scripts to just to pass those environment variables, and then I will start my containers uh, for the microservices. So for this first demo, we are going to use, I've, I want to start my microservices and I want them to connect to the United States East cluster. I will show you that cluster immediately. All right, so that's what's happening right now. Let it start. And in the meantime, let me show you my first cluster. This is the cluster that we are going to use first for, uh, for the current version of the application. I'm running at the cluster across the United States and I have a node in the United States East 4, North, North Virginia, in South Carolina East 1, and in the US, United States Central, Iowa. Also, I have read replicas, but hold on, read replicas are ready for the next phase of this company grows. And this is the cluster uh, my application is connecting to. So generally my virtual machine from the United States East 4, North Virginia, is connecting to this one. And also you see this one, this star, preferred region. It means that all the nodes that are deployed in Northern Virginia, US East 4, they are going to store the primary copies of all of the records. So generally, whenever you read or write, by default, all the requests will go to this, to, to this region. That's what I want to do, just to minimize the latencies. All right. Uh, if to judge by the logs, uh, the microservices are up and running. How how else can we check? Remember, we have this discovery service. Uh, let's go to their uh, Google Cloud Console. That's the public IP address. And I do this, 8761. All right. That's my discovery server, Spring Cloud, Eureka. And all the services are running. Kitchen service, uh, tracker, and gateway. Wonderful. We are up and running. So what do we want to do next? Uh, let me uh, send this uh, to the background. And I want to first, first, I want to clean the database because I was certainly preparing for this uh, workshop and I inserted a few records into the database. That's why let's use the kitchen service again right now. Imagine that the customers use this real application that are connecting to this backend that is running in the United States East Coast and the backend and, and the mobile front end and the web front end sends requests to this. Uh, you, you actually can remove localhost because, in, in fact, uh, your applications and mobile applications will be sending requests to some real IP address that runs gateway. So we are sending this request to the gateway, and then the gateway will forward this request to the kitchen. So let's delete all the orders deleted. So now we are lucky. We've got the very first customer who lives in New York City, and the customer orders uh, pizza. Okay, let's do that. All right, the first order is there, the second one, the third one. Three customers ordered our pizza. And so here is uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. That's the result. So actually the backend, the kitchen, the kitchen microservice responded that the order was placed into the database and that's the latency. So that's the latency between the uh, kitchen microservice, the backend, and the database, it took 80 milliseconds to write down this order. Why, why 80 milliseconds? Because I'm using a multi-region co configuration. So the request went to this node in the United States East 4, and then this node used synchronous draft replication to synchronize this change to the other two data centers. So that's why 80 milliseconds, but I think that's a wonderful you know, trade-off, especially if you want to withstand various outages. Uh, it's really fast. What's about the tracker microservice? Uh, for the tracker microservice, let me do the get request. Let me get back this order number one, because let's say the customer from New York decided to check what's the status when the pizza is going to be delivered. Uh, let's do this once again, order number two and order number three, the same stuff. 
the order is still being ordered. Uh, there is uh, the, the chef is not the kitchen is not working on uh, does not work on this order yet. But check the latency. The latency is just four milliseconds single digit latency. Why? Because this application instance. And this gateway, they are running on the virtual machine from the United States East 4. And this machine is connected to this cluster, to this cluster node in the United States East 4. And the primary copy for all of the orders is stored here. That's, it's just, you know, the same region. It just cross a cross availability zone request. And that's why it's around like two or three or four milliseconds. It's really fast. Okay. It's damn fast. Okay. So uh, any questions, folks? Because uh, I would say that... That was success for the company. So the company created this first version of the pizza application, this geo-distributed application, and already functions. The application backend right now runs in the United States East, but certainly you can deploy this across multiple regions. You can just you take the same application, you can take the same microservices, and you deploy them in all of the locations whenever you need it. It's it's just simple. And what's next? So let's put this check mark. This this part of the workshop is done. And now, let's say that several months later, we have a year later, uh, the company keeps growing. Uh, this pizza service and this pizza pizza store, pizza company becomes well known. And uh, we've got some. We are no longer a startup company. We are an established company. We have some runaway. We some have some some cash to burn, and we want to scale. And we want to experiment with in, like uh, with their with with, an, with international markets. So that's why we decided to open uh, the first. Uh, just location in Germany and Australia, we want to start ser serving customers there. So why not? And the question is, all right, but what's about the customer experience? Because we already have this cluster running, we have the application instance, like, but what, what, what's going to be the latency? Yeah, let, let's take a look. So generally what we have, uh, let me do this. I have, we provisioned, to virtual machine. We are going to deploy the application in Europe West VM, that's Frankfurt in Germany, and also in Australia Southeast region. It's nearby uh, Sydney. So let's connect to these two locations. Split vertically. So first I want to connect to, to the location in uh, Germany. Ready, and also let me change this default input. I will change this to Germany. Done. Next, so what type of I want these application instances to be connected to read replica nodes. I'll explain you why. So let me go to the pizza store, Spring Cloud, the same source code. And now when I will be deploying this, when I will be deploying this, I will be using this configuration. I want to connect, I want my microservices to connect to a replica node, to the, to the database replica node in Frankfurt. It's nearby. So let me start doing that. This replica node is here. So if I go to the nodes of my multi-region cluster, these are my primary nodes, right? And all the changes are synchronized synchronously within here, but also you can read from replicas. So because, you know, what we decided to do, why do we want to use read replicas in the beginning? Because that's the easiest way to scale reads. And it's probably that's the best, one of the best ways to keep growing if you already have some clusters running and you just want to boost reads because just face it, most of the time, most of the applications, what customers do, they read, 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 right? They just check your product catalog, they check your pages, they check uh, whatever your application does, and only then they will write something down. So that's why the first approach, you can attach read replicas to your existing cluster, and this way you can um, expedite reads. So let's start with read replicas to boost reads, okay? So we are starting... We are already doing this in uh, Germany. And let me do the same in uh, Australia. For Australia, so my virtual machine in Australia has this IP address. Let me SSH to this machine as well. 
Done. Ready? We are doing the same experiment. Uh, let's do the to the samples apps. Let's go to the pizza store Spring Cloud version. And also let's change uh, this. I will write down Sydney. No, let's let's do this. Let's write down Australia. Good. And now, so here is. I will be connecting to the replica node in Australia. Okay, so here is, and what's important, we are not only deploying microservice instances in all of those locations in the United States or Germany or Sydney, we also deploy those uh, utility services, discovery server and gateway. So like each location will have its own instance of the discovery server and of their gateway. That's why what we can check, we can check like whether those microservices are up and running this way. It's just taking the public IP address uh, for the of the node in Germany. Let's open it and let's open the port of their discovery server. All right, everything is running. The kitchen gateway and they're ready to uh, take orders in their building. And let's do the same for Australia. Okay, so what's happening with Australia? I think that we are still starting in Australia. Yeah, like it started and right now I see that my microservices are registering with the discovery. So like anyway, folks, uh, those of you who are Java developers, uh, you should be familiar with this Spring Cloud, Discovery Server and Gateway, etc. If you are not a Java developer, just don't worry. Those are just special, special uh, services uh, that are available special tools and framework that are used by the Java guys uh, to develop just geo-distributed and distributed applications in the cloud. Okay, so everything is ready in Australia. Everything is ready in Europe and everything is ready in the United States. Now let's uh, do this. Imagine that I want to post, I want to post the first Order. I want to buy the first pizza in Berlin, like one of our customers. What do we want to do? Uh, right. We need to send the request to our gateway kitchen. And we are telling, all right, that's order number 10. And uh, that's the customer from Berlin. So first, so what's happening right now? Why do I have this delay? Why do I have this latency? Because uh, by default, when you open the connections uh, for the first time, uh, you should warm up your connections because this replica node that resides in uh, Germany, it needs to connect to the primary cluster in the United States and load all the system metadata from the primary nodes in the United States to the, uh, to the replica in uh, in, in, in Europe. So that's why it usually takes time, but that's just for your first connection. Once the connections are warmed up, uh, let me show you how much time it takes to put an order from Berlin, like order number 11, 12. It takes like uh, 300 uh, milliseconds versus uh, versus how how much time it was taking in, uh, yeah, it was taking around 18 or 20 milliseconds in uh, in the United States. And this is like fine because you can use what's, what's good actually, folks. You can use. So this instance is connected to this replica node in the West. And that's the only one connection you need to have in your application backend. So that this kitchen service is connected to this backend. And even if you need to send write requests, like here is you want to send this write. You just send this request to the replica node and the replica node forwards this request to the primary cluster in the United States. And then it's this request is synchronized uh, in North America. All right. But what's about reads? Because, all right, this, 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 this is fine. But customers probably right now, it's, it's not a big deal because we don't have a big customer base in Berlin. And we can live with this latency. But we certainly want our customers to have a wonderful experience when they will be serving our menu, pizza menu. It, it needs to be as fast as possible. And we already have replicas, right? And, and as a reminder, this application instance is connected to the replica node in Europe. So let's, we already have this order in place for uh, Berlin. So let's connect to the tracker microservice and let's check. All right, what's, what's the status of my order in Berlin? So I just can put order number 10. 
And again, tracker microservice is another application instance. It also needs to connect to the primary cluster and load all the system metadata. That's why the first request takes a little bit more time. But once you start checking the order for order 11, 12, or whatever, the latency is around four milliseconds and doesn't remind you of anything. That's the same latency you have in the United States. So like the, the customers who live in the United States and the customers who live in Berlin, they will have the same latency for it thanks to the read replicas. But also what you need to remember about read replicas because uh, read replicas, they don't store the latest data. There is some data lag because first the, requ the request, the, the, the data is always written to the primary nodes in the United States. And then uh, these changes are asynchronously transferred to the replica nodes. So there will be some data lag, but at least everything that you read from read replica is consistent, transactionally consistent, just probably not the latest status. And that's not a big deal because who cares? Like if right now the status is ordered while in a few seconds, the status will be baking or delivering. It's not a big deal, right? So, all right, we achieved the same read latency for the customers in New York City and Berlin. Great. How about Australia? So for Australia, the application instances are also running and that backend, my microservices are connected to the read replica in Australia. So that's the connection endpoint, remember? So what I wanna do first, I also want to post the first order in Sydney. Let's do this. And again, I'm opening my connection pool right now. Uh, this replica node is connecting to the primary cluster loading all the system metadata so what you would usually do in production when you deploy the application instance you would warm up those connections right before you make this application instance available for your uh, uh, users and customers so let's uh, check it but right now when i'm putting order number 21 22 the latency is around 700 milliseconds why because still the red replica node will get this request to put your order for sydney in the system but this request will be forwarded to the database nodes in the united states and uh, so this request either goes through the pacific ocean from sydney or through uh asia europe and through atlantic ocean so it's just a very long way, right? But nevertheless, not a big deal because remember what we are doing? We just opening the first locations in Germany and Australia and we are using read replicas to boost reads, right? We want to scale reads. That's fine with us. We don't care about writes right now. Uh, but what's about reads? Let's check the order, number 20. So I don't need the location right now, just order number 20. And again, this is the request to the tracker microservice. It also will open its own connection pool and uh, it needs to load the system metadata. Once the system metadata is loaded, uh, take a look at this uh, order number 21, 22. So the latency is five milliseconds, you know? Doesn't remind you of anything. Five milliseconds to check the status for the order in Australia. Four milliseconds uh, to check the same, like the status for the orders in Berlin. And four milliseconds to check the status for the orders in New York City. Right? Wonderful. So what you created, you created just two distributed application, you know, simple microservices that are deployed in three different locations. They're deployed right now on these virtual machines. And the latency for reads is wonderful. We are using read replicas, okay? So what does it mean? We are done with this milestone of our company. So the first locations are opened in Germany and Australia, and we are doing this experiment. And what happened, let's say several months later, uh, we found that, all right, so that experiment was worthwhile and we just want to grow in Europe. We want to grow big internationally, internationally in Germany and Australia. We want to start serving as many customers as possible in Berlin and Sydney. Now, Alejandro, we are not using X-Cluster replication. So right now what I was showing, I was demonstrating. So the last demo was for the so we're still using a multi-region cluster in the United States and we used uh, read replica nodes in Frankfurt and in Sydney, okay? So that's what we used. Next, so, and when we want to grow big internationally, it means that we are expecting much, much, much higher load 
uh, for pizza orders because many more customers from Berlin and from Sydney will be just ordering the pizzas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and we just want those requests to be stored in Europe and in Australia. We don't want those requests to travel through the oceans to the United States cluster, right? Because what? The first reason is latency, and second one is data regulatory requirements. Requirements because all those orders, especially in Europe, uh, they will be. You, if you know the order who ordered this pizza, you will be able to track back to a customer, and this is personal information. And this information, like pizza order, needs to be stored in Europe, not in the United States, unless you kind of uh, make IDs anonymous, but nevertheless. So for that, if I want to grow big internationally, as Alejandro asked, you can use X cluster replication, actually. You can deploy three standalone clusters of Yuga by DB. One cluster will be in the United States, another cluster will be in Europe, and the third cluster will be in Australia. And if needed, you can enable a synchronous replication between those locations. It's possible. This is what we call X cluster replication. And thanks, Alejandro, for bringing this up. But we are not going to use X cluster replication in this demo. What I'm going to use instead, I want to use a geo partitioned cluster for that to scale both reads and writes globally, right? And uh, and this geo partitioned cluster, I already have one provisioned. Going back to my Yuga by DB manager, that's my geo partition cluster. No, not this one. This one. So I will have nodes in North Virginia, United States East Four. I will have nodes in Australia and Sydney, and I will have in Europe and Frankfurt. If you take a look here in every region, I have three nodes, and all those nodes are deployed across several availability zones. So this cluster will be able to withstand zone level outages uh, in those data centers. So that's that's that, that's all right. So from the table standpoint, let me show you what's happening here. I have the same pizza order table, but also you define this table spaces. So table spaces uh, is a concept of uh, Postgres. In Postgres, you have you use table special table spaces to pin data to specific disk drives. While in Yuga by DB, we reuse table spaces, but we allow you to pin your data to specific database nodes. So basically, if uh, the, the the orders for the customers from the United States will be pinned to the database nodes in North Virginia, and the orders, let's say, for the customers from Australia will be pinned to their database nodes in Sydney. So that's simple, right? It's all easy. So now, what I want to do, I want to leverage this geo distributed cluster, and this means, folks, that I need to restart my microservices. I need to restart my microservices, kitchen microservice and tracker microservice on in all of those three locations. So let's do that. My configuration, uh, geo, geo, I have several geo configurations. I have geo US DB connection sent up. And again, a reminder, what's inside? I don't show you this SH script. It basically what it does, this SH script initializes this environment variables that are used by the microservices, DB address, user, and password. And I don't want you folks to see the password. That's why I don't show you what's inside. So this is what the script does. The script initializes those variables and restarts my microservices. So let me uh, restart the microservices, the kitchen and the tracker microservice in the United States. I am going to do the same in Germany, but for the Germany, I am telling that when you restart, please connect to the database nodes in Frankfurt. And lastly, we are restarting my microservices in uh, Australia, and we are going to connect to the database node in Sydney. Good? Clear. Also, I'm not touching the gateway instances. I'm not touching the discovery server. That's why I can just go here and see, all right, the microservices have already been restarted in the United States. What's about Europe? Now in Europe, we still have the gateway, but the microservices are being uh, booted. And the same is here. So we are waiting for these microservices to start. All right, the microservices are up and running in Europe. And... Uh, how about Australia? Yeah, it takes a little bit more time to start in Australia. So here is what I have here. Waiting. Okay. And it looks like the microservices have just registered with our discovery server. And all is good. All the microservices are ready. So what, what do we want to do next? First, let's make sure that all of them are connected 
to the right database nodes. To remind you, the, the microservices from the United States are connected to the database nodes in the United States. That's obvious. How about Europe? In Europe, European microservices are connected to Europe. Just, you know, some sanity check. And Kitchen and Tracker from Australia connected to the database nodes in Australia. So done, they are restarted. So now let's do this. The first experiment, uh, I also played with this database instance before this workshop. So that's why let me use this HTTP request to the gateway to clean all the orders that might be in the system. And this request will clean, even though I am sending this request to the database node in the United States, this request will go to all of the nodes. The data will be cleaned from uh, all of their locations globally from Europe and Australia. All right. And now let me post the first order. Let's say I'm ordering the pizza in New York. And with the geo partition cluster, right? And actually, this is what we were discussing with Alejandro in Slack. Uh, with geo partition cluster, you have your connection pool. So your database, when it will be opening connection, it might be also loading some system metadata if the system metadata is stored somewhere. So that's why you want to warm up your connection pool, uh, because generally, once the connection pool is warmed up, take a look at the latency. I'm putting new orders in the system, and the latency for the write. This is write request. The latency between the backend microservice in the database is seven milliseconds. Wonderful, like for the right. Uh, because all the requests from this instance goes to the database node in the United States. And they are stored in the United States. They're not stored in Europe or Australia. How about Germany? How about uh, European Union? Uh, let's also uh, order, let's say, order number 10, some customer from Berlin. So this one, what's for this one, it will take more time to initialize connection pool because uh, the primary, the system metadata is stored in the United States by default. This is generally how my cluster is configured. That's why when you are opening the first connections, uh, it will take more time to pull this data from Europe, okay? But once you pull this connection, like once you have this connection established, uh, take a look at this. How much time does it take to post to put an order in the system? Eight milliseconds here, seven milliseconds there, the same latency. And this is your geo distributed application. It's like basically because the orders, all the orders for the customers who live in Berlin are stored in the European nodes. They're stored on these nodes from Frankfurt. They're not stored in uh, Northern Virginia or Sydney. And the last, I want to see the same numbers. I want to see the same latencies for the nodes in Australia, for the customers in Australia. That's why uh, let's order a pizza in Sydney. Okay. And again, it took, it, it, you know, oh, actually, you know what? It just was a fraction of time. The connection pool was initialized so fast in Sydney, which means that probably the system metadata is stored in Sydney and I messed up with my configuration. Uh, but nevertheless, this is uh, an example for you, like, because this system metadata was stored in Sydney. It took me just, you know, several milliseconds to initialize the connection pool. In other locations, this was taking several seconds. But uh, let's take a look. Order number 21, 22, and 23 are in the system in Sydney. It's ordered. And the latency, seven milliseconds in Sydney, eight milliseconds in Germany, and seven milliseconds in the United States East Coast. The same application, the same application logic. The application instances are just deployed across different locations, right? US East, West, Europe, and Australia South. And you're using this geo partition, single geo partition cluster. And this geo partitioning feature allows you to store the data when it needs to be. This way you're complying with data regulatory requirements and you have the same low latency globally. That's wonderful. So now, okay, so the writes are fast and this is everything consistent. What's important, uh, you still have, when you write an order, let's say in the United States, it's going to be synchronized using Raft consensus protocol across these three nodes in the United States. And uh, you will be able to, with the following configuration, you will be able to withstand zone level outages. Exceptional, right? Keep this in mind. So now let's check the reads. I want to check the status uh, for my order number one in New York. And I'm sending the request through the gateway and the gateway will forward this request to the tracker microservice. 
And here is again, you see we are opening the tracker microservices, another application instance, and this application instance also needs to uh, warm up its connection pools. And as we figure out, uh, the system metadata right now is stored in Australia. So that's why the nodes from the United States need to pull this information from Australia during the first connection opening. Let's wait. It should take several seconds. And let me actually do the same in Germany. I want to check, well, I want to check the status for my order, let's say 10, uh, that was in Berlin. Okay, it, it took prohibitively long time, but nevertheless, uh, let's check the status. Once the connection pool is warmed up, you see that it takes just five milliseconds to get the status for your order in the United States. How about, uh, ah, it's still warming up the connections in Germany, all right. Let's give it some time. And in the meantime, I will check this for Australia. I know that I have order number 20 uh, that was placed for Sydney. Okay, and the latency, order 20, order 21, order 22. It's also nine, like nine, nine, nine milliseconds. It's single digit latency. It's comparable to what you have in the United States, right? Like also five milliseconds if you just execute it one more time. So what's about Europe? Once the connection pool is warmed up, so here is, you see, uh, where does this request go? Why the latency is so high? All right, so the, the latency is good now. Probably the Java, some Java garbage collection or whatever. Uh, but that's what we have, the same compatible latency. So this is what you uh, this is what a geo partition cluster is capable of. It allows you, it's a single cluster, you decide what connection your application instance will be, what database connection your application instance will have. So for instance, this cluster node for this application instance is from the United States East are connected to the node in the United States East. Uh, this one, these application instances are connected to Europe with three and these nodes are connected to the database nodes in Australia Southeast one. And then the data, if the data is for the Specific locations is going to be stored in the nodes from that specific location. And if you're using Yuga by DB Managed, you can find all this connectivity endpoints here in the UI. This is where I'm taking this connection endpoints from. But also, what's what's another cool thing about geo partition cluster? Because it can happen then, let's say that I live in the United States and I love this pizza company. And one day I travel to London or like to Berlin. And my family sends me a text message and my kids ask me, hey, daddy, please order pizza for us, right? And what I'm doing, I am in Berlin right now and I want to order a pizza for my kids. So basically my I, I take my mobile phone and there my application, my mobile phone uh, gets connected to the backend in Germany because I live close to, because right now I'm in Germany. And so generally the backend in Germany gets this uh, HTTP request. It asks me, all right, Mr. Dennis wants to order pizza for their kids. And, but that order would be for, from, for, for New York because my, my kids are in New York right now. They're waiting for that pizza in New York city, but I'm in Berlin and I'm doing this order from there. And this backend will be able to forward this order to their database node in the United States. It's just basically will take a little bit more time. It will take like 350 milliseconds, not five milliseconds, but it's all possible. Uh, the beauty is that my application keeps using this database connection endpoint. It doesn't need to open database connection endpoints with the nodes in the United States. The cluster, the database cluster is intelligent. It's smart enough to figure out that, all right, if you want to put this order from Germany, but for the customer in New York City, then we will basically forward this request to the database nodes in, in the United States and the request and, the, and, the, and, and, that, and those orders will be stored in the United States. So that's it, okay? And so here is, for instance, that was order number eight. I would probably can get this from the United States right now using, um, I have this API uh, location, let's say New York. I have a special API endpoint that returns all the orders. Okay, so this is this is my order number eight that was just ordered from Germany. So it's it's stored in New York. It's stored there. It's wonderful, right? How do you like this, guys? Okay, so 
the summary here that with geo partition cluster it will place pin your data to a specific location based on the value of your geo partitioning column and for me this geo partitioning column let me show it to you pizza store geo partition with replication factor one this is my pizza order table so location store location and if the store location is for New York, it's going to be stored in the United States table space and those nodes. If it's Berlin, it's going to be stored in a different table space, different nodes. It's all ha handled, let's say, seamlessly on the uh, on the application layer. And then if you just want from, New from Sydney or from Berlin to get data that is stored in New York or any other nodes, it's, it's all easy. It's all handled by the database for you. Just one connection and point. That's all your application needs to have. So what else to show you? I think that that's that's enough. That's already enough of details for you, which means that we can go ahead and put a check mark here. We managed to grow big internationally because right now we're providing these pizzas. We're selling these pizzas across New York, uh, Berlin, and Sydney. And you saw that the latency we store the data in specific location. The latency is low globally, whether you live in Sydney, Berlin, or New York, you will have single digit milliseconds latencies for your local data, for your local orders, which means that our geo-distributed pizza application is ready and uh, mission accomplished. So before we close, let me check the questions. Uh, all right, I see a question from Alejandro. Do you just connect to the database to warm up the connection pool or you have a specific query no, so what I do right now, I don't warm it up actually. Uh, what I, I know that you are writing, you're using Node.js. Uh, my application is a Java application. So in Java, what happens? Let's take this kitchen microservice. It basically uses, I use Spring data and uh, Spring, Spring Boot, and I'm connecting to this database. So whenever I start sending the first application requests, I'm doing that. But you can actually, how you can warm this up if you want to warm up a connection, uh, like connection warm up, right? You can do something like uh, connect and select, select one or something like this, just for your connections and uh, that should help you. Let's actually check it, it should work. Uh, I can, what I can do, uh, so what I wanna do, let me, yeah, let me open my file with the password and I will show you, I will connect to this multi-region cluster. Uh, I can go to the, we have Cloud Shell, if you're using Yuga by DB Managed, uh, where is it? Yeah, connect button, connect, uh, let, let me launch Cloud Shell. And if you're using Geo Partition Cluster, you can, dis you can decide on location. Let me connect uh, from Frankfurt to the node from Frankfurt. Waiting. So what it happens right now, we use Kubernetes internally and this um, you will have this Cloud Shell instance for you. And as long as I'm connecting from the United States East Coast to Europe, it will take more time. Usually when I'm, I'm using an instance from the East Coast, it's faster. Uh, but this request, come on. So what's the password? Let me check the password one more time. Ah, that, that was the wrong password, guys. Uh, let me use the right password. <coughs> okay. So here, as you can see, the schema. So, and I think that, yeah, so what ha what's also happening right now, this is exactly the case. This node from Frankfurt, it doesn't store the primary system metadata and it loads this metadata from the nodes in Sydney, because it turns out that uh, in Sydney, the, uh, the Sydney stores the primary metadata. Usually it happens much faster, but uh, that's demo, that's workshop, something needs to be sluggish, right? Something yeah. needs to be a little bit slow, let's wait. All right, let me cancel this request. Let me do the select one. Yeah, like basically this is what Alejandro you can do if you want to warm up your caches. So like, that's what I would do. Just you open to connection and before uh, just start your application, just run this select uh, for for your uh, 
for as many connections as you allow to have as part of your connection pool. And that's going to be all right. Slash D. So what's happening with this slash D? It's strange. Probably I need to open a ticket for the Yuga by DB manage team. But let's wait. I think it will manage this eventually. For some reason, it takes more time to load this uh, through this console, but I'll wait. Any other questions, my friends? Because generally we are done uh, and uh, the closing words just thank you for coming. Thank you for coming and thank you for staying. Uh, also, if you don't know that we do Yuga by DB community open hours, that's a special live stream that we handle, we do bi-weekly. Uh, come there, we always <coughs> we always show something interesting, some updates and some fun stuff. And this is actually the, if you want us to demonstrate something, you can just write down me and Frank a note in Slack, and then we will just cover this in Yuga by DB community open hours. So generally, you can watch it from LinkedIn, you can watch it from YouTube, how it looks like. Just every, yeah. This is the, those are our live streams from the Yuga by DB community open hours. Okay, and so finally, so metadata was loaded. Uh, so now, yeah, so these are my pizza. And there, what I also wanted to show you pizza order. That's my pizza order table. This pizza order table should have several of these partitions. Yeah, I don't know, like probably that was not a good idea to connect to the Frankfurt node to execute this request. But generally, this is what I have here and you can experiment with it. Let me cancel it. Nevertheless, yeah, Frankfurt was not the best node for this request. And this is what I need to do, like a follow up for my Yuga DB managed team why the connection for slash D was so high. All right. So done. So let's check what we learned today. Geo distributed applications, just applications that are deployed across several locations. We were deploying our application across the United States, pizza company, United States, uh, Europe, and Australia. Uh, those are basically applications that function across multiple availability zones, data centers, or regions. Why do you want to build those applications for high availability, for global low latency, right? Uh, today, the demo was focused on the global low latency in data residency requirements. And we, you saw that how we achieved low latency across uh, across uh, all of those locations for both reasons, right? And we did this by, you know, following this company growth because you don't need just to deploy probably if you know that right now you don't need to have a geo partition cluster because you might, it's enough for you to have a, uh, just a multi-region cluster in the United States and Europe. Go for it right in the beginning. Then you can always boost reads by deploying read replicas. So you will be able to bo boost both reads and writes by switching to a geo partition cluster. And this is what we experimented with today. And don't forget to join us, uh, our Yuga by DB uh, community open hours. Uh, actually, yeah, Frank said you can buy DB batch size. Okay, okay. Yeah, we can test it. So, yeah, folks, we're already out of time, but uh, so what Frank suggested, and I think that at some point in time, Frank, it's going to be, it's going to be uh, enabled by default, because right now the batch size is low, and this is actually, Alejandro, what you also can you want to try to do for your deployments, uh, especially if you're going to run, let's say, some so some requests using joining data, etc. But this is a nice tips and trick. This this definitely would uh, improve the uh, latency for those slash D requests. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks everyone for coming and thanks everyone for joining the session. See you. Bye bye. <laughs>